All right, so tonight we're going to speak about Parashat Da'alotecha. That's this week's latest portion of the Torah. Very important parasha. There is a very central theme in Judaism that is sometimes overlooked. People do not pay enough attention to it. When they learn the Torah, they read through it, and they don't realize that there's a very important idea that is being expressed towards the end of the parasha. And that is the topic of Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara can be translated negative speech, slanderous talk, and I have a whole lecture about it in the internet called Lashon Hara, a language that kills. It is a very, very serious transgression for one to engage in negative talk about other people. We're not even talking about lies. That's called Sheker, something that is more serious and that is negative, negative talk about another individual. What's strange, however, is that the Torah brings up this topic in association with a brother and a sister. We're dealing with Miriam, talking about Moshe, a brother who she loves. She very much cared for him when he was born. Aharon is somewhat involved as well. He overhears what the sister has to say, and he doesn't say anything. What went on? She was upset somewhat. She couldn't understand why her brother separated from his wife. She understood that he's a prophet, but so are they. There was no clear instructions from Hashem to any of them to stay away from their husbands, from their spouse. So why did Moshe do something like that? She felt bad for Moshe's wife. So she had this whole discussion with her brother Aharon about her own brother, Moshe. And Hashem, of course, was upset. And I'm not going to go through the whole discussion in the Torah. You're welcome to read it. What Hashem does as a result of the Lashon Ara, and how Hashem says that this was a terrible sin. And you can read it for yourself, and you will be impressed that this is very serious indeed. This topic of Lashon Ara is extensively discussed in Judaism. It's not found in non-Jewish sources. You may find slander. Yes, slander is definitely something wrong, and it's a crime to slander someone, to give him a bad name that's not based on some proof that you can show. You cannot just assassinate someone's reputation unless you can somehow back it up. But who gave you the right to do so, even if you can back it up? Even if you can prove that it's true? Who says it's right? Who says it's the correct thing to do? So we, we need to understand why the Torah puts great emphasis on this. So much so, that we are told that it's actually a mitzvah to remind ourselves on a regular basis what happened to Miriam. What happened to Miriam during the 40 years journey that the Jewish people were in the desert, how she, she contracted a discoloration of the skin, which we call leprosy, but it's not exactly leprosy, how everyone had to wait for her until she recovered completely until she healed from the Sarat. Why is the Torah so much against the Lashon Ara here? What was so wrong of her to say what she said? Even though it was true, still Hashem said it is wrong. Whenever I speak about this topic, I remind people that if you have any doubts about a situation, instead of talking about it with someone else, go over to the individual who you doubt, who you question, who you have an issue with, and first talk it over with them. And don't try to guess or to imagine things which may be in the end very, very wrong. Still, we need to understand why the Torah was so strict about this. And it's not for nothing that the parasha of the Meraglim, the spies, the next week's parasha, is right next to the incident with Miriam. 
because the Meraglim, the spies, also brought back a negative report about the land of Israel. And they also suffered the consequences as a result of their negative speech. So we need to understand why is the Torah so strict about this. Aaron is also punished briefly, not as much as Miriam, but because he didn't protest. He just kept quiet. Listening to Lashon Ara, even if you don't say anything, is also wrong. It's not just the one that talks the Lashon Ara is like doing something wrong. The one that is listening to it and allowing the individual to continue where he should be protesting and saying, this is wrong of you to say what you're saying. So people think that Lashon Ara is so bad because we're hurting the individual we're talking about. Yes, it's true. You can be talking about someone thousands of miles away and you can hurt him a lot more than with a bullet. With a bullet, you have to be close somewhat to hurt him. But with one speech, you can hurt someone even from thousands of miles away. Okay, so we may think that that is why the Torah is against this Lashon Ara, because this is a form of, uh, you're hurting someone. It doesn't have to be physical to hurt someone. You can hurt someone with your mouth, with your speech. Perhaps that is why the Torah is against it. Yes and no. Of course, obviously, it is wrong to hurt someone in any way. But what people forget, don't realize, is that when an individual speaks Lashon Ara about someone else, he's hurting himself. He's not only hurting someone else, he's also hurting himself. How is he hurting himself? In the beginning of the parasha, the Torah discusses how Aharon lit the candles. That was his job. There's a description of what happens when he lights the candles. He has to make sure that the flame rises on its own. He would be in charge of cleaning the menorah, preparing the menorah for the next time he lights it. What's so symbolic about the menorah? So the Kabbalah teaches that the light is symbolic not only of the Torah, which we know, it's also symbolic and it reminds us of the neshama, of the soul. Look at the flame, how it is always aiming upwards. Because the neshama is a chelek ilokamimal, it does come from above, and it wants to return to its source. It's therefore always aiming or striving to go up, to elevate itself. Aharon was given this job for a variety of reasons, but one explanation is, since Aharon was always involved in elevating people, motivating them, making them feel good, bringing peace between husband and wife, and between people who argued and got into a very, very bad argument. He was a peacemaker. So what was his job? His job focused on the soul of the individual, to try to improve people's lives, to try to elevate them. So here he's given a job that is associated somewhat with that, dealing with kindling the soul, the neshama, by lighting the candles. So here, Aaron is dealing with the neshama, perfecting it, elevating it, bringing peace amongst people. That's beautiful, isn't it? It's a big mitzvah. Lashon Ara does the exact opposite. Instead of uniting people and bringing peace amongst them, it breaks up relationships. It separates them. And not only does it do it between husband and wife and between people in general, but the individual himself, instead of aiming to elevate himself, to perfect himself, to become a better person, it actually lowers him. How does it lower him? Because Lashon Ara, by its nature, lowers another individual. That's what he's doing. By speaking negatively about another human being, you are lowering his value. And by lowering his value, people don't realize they are lowering their own value as well. That's something that they don't see, but that is the immediate consequence of their action. And as we will see, what this does to an individual. So once again, the Torah is not only concerned about what this is doing to others, the damage that this does in society, but 
the damage that this does to an individual himself. Where the human being was endowed with the power of speech, something so special. For what reason? Speech is supposed to connect much stronger than a handshake. We talk to people. Well, it depends how we talk to them. Do we yell at them? Do we curse them? Or do we praise them, bless them, thank them? Speech can connect. And in the same way that speech can connect or disconnect between people, this is the key to a better relationship with Kadosh Baruch Hu, with God too. The power of speech, Shmirat HaLashon, how we guard our tongue, will also determine how close our relationship will be with Hashem. How we use our speech through prayer, giving thanks and praising Hashem, through learning Torah, this will make a big difference. So the key here to a, a better relationship with Hashem and with people depends on speech. Or, God forbid, it's also the key to dissolving relationships, to undoing what may have been a, once upon a time a beautiful relationship. Aharon, when he would light the candles, what would he have to do? He would have to make sure that the flame was burning on its own. He didn't have to go back again and again to make sure that it's lit. Once it was lit, hopefully it would stay lit. Until it would be going up on its own, by itself. What happens in life is that if people continuously do the right thing, with time, hopefully, there will be a momentum. A momentum that will give them the strength to continue to do so for the rest of their life. They don't have to put so much effort like they did in the very, very beginning. Once you've done it over and over again, hopefully you will stay with it. And that is really the whole idea of Jewish education. When a father transmits the tradition to his child early on when he's a child and doesn't fully understand on his own the importance of what he's doing, the father has to teach and teach and teach and remind and remind and remind. Eventually, hopefully, the child will do it on his own without being told. That is the goal. The goal is that you don't have to be reminded of being told the importance of something. You understand on your own. You gravitate towards the right things, and you gravitate away from the wrong things. That's called sur mera v'asetov, where the, the rabbis tell us a great effort has to be made to stay away from evil, and to do that which is right. As the verse, the verse says, Sur Merava Seto, a great effort has to be made in order to accomplish it. It doesn't just happen by itself. Life is full of challenges. But once we train ourselves to do so on a regular basis, hopefully we will realize on our own that this is not right. Our judgment will tell us, stay away from this. Sometimes people are in doubt. They hesitate, they have to ask, because they're unsure. It happens, depending on the, what the issue is, but the more one trains himself to do the right thing and to stay away from that which is wrong, he on his own, on his own will want to do what's right. He won't need a reminder. The fact that we are told, remember what happened to Miriam, remember this. Doesn't that remind you of remember Amalek? Remember Shabbat. It says the word Zachor there as well. Why? Why do, why do we need to remember? We just said that the more you get used to it, hopefully it will happen by itself. Just like with Aharon, lighting the candles, once it's lit, you can let go of it. The problem is that with Lashon Ara, there is always, always a continuous challenge for a person to perhaps find fault in another individual. It's human nature to find fault either because people enjoy it or because there's some fault that they have and it makes them happy that somebody else has that fault too. There's a, a lot of reasons why people like to find fault and point out that which is negative in someone else. A lot of reasons. So here, the Torah is telling us, you have to remember this. 
You have to remember this not only because it's wrong, because it's for your own good. Remember that flame that Aharon lit? You want that flame to be continuously lit. You want that Neshama to continuously shine and aim towards upstairs, aim towards elevating itself into having a stronger connection with Hashem. Do you want that? Is that your goal? Then make sure that you're careful in this particular area with your speech. This is the simple explanation as to why Lashon Ra is damaging not only to another individual but also to oneself. It actually can make a difference whether he will continuously grow or, God forbid, whether he will continue to go down. How do we know this? That so much depends on our tongue. What comes to mind? Another verse that says, Mavet v'chayim beyad lashon. Death and life depend on our tongue. Death and life? Yeah, you could think, well, I guess death and life means perhaps we, we're talking nice to people, we give them life, perhaps we talk not nice to them, we, we hurt them. What does it mean, Mavet v'chayim beyad lashon? It means our own life. Our own life depends directly on how we use or misuse that tongue. Forget for a moment what this can do, the damage that this can do to others. Forget about that for a moment. For you yourself, if you say the wrong words, you can hurt yourself. We know that when we make mistakes. We can hurt ourselves. If we say the right thing, we can perhaps be rewarded for it. We impress someone. So much depends on our speech. This is something, therefore, that people are unaware of. What Lashon Ara does to themselves. They can somewhat appreciate the fact that this is very damaging to someone else. But how this does damage to themselves, they don't know. Now, what's interesting here is that there's a big difference between Judaism and other religions, and other systems of law. Rabbis tell us, take a look, for example, at the Chochmah of Goyim. The Goyim can be very knowledgeable. If somebody tells you, I know a non-Jew who's very wise and knowledgeable, Tamim, believe him. Chochmah Bagoyim Tamim. If somebody tells you Torah Bagoyim, that the Goyim, the non-Jews, have a very good system of laws, don't believe him. Why? You probably know that man has reached the moon. That takes a lot of <laughs> technology and knowledge we know, we very well know that man is very capable, every, every human being is capable of, of great achievements and he can definitely be a, very, be a very knowledgeable individual. So if they tell you someone in the non-Jewish world is a very wise individual, believe him, it's possible. They've accomplished a great deal. But if somebody tells you they have a perfect set of laws, a, a very good system of law that works, well, don't believe it. It's not possible. They don't have Torah. What's the difference between what we have in the Torah and they have? So for that, we turn to the American Constitution as an example. Since the system of laws in this country is somewhat a good system of laws compared to other nations in the world, right? This is a democracy, and a lot of people feel that this is a very good system to manage affairs in a country in a democratic way. So therefore, what's the system in this country based on? Something called the Constitution, where it is explained how to manage this country, how to run the country. What else does it say? That there needs to be a balance of powers between the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches of power. There needs to be a balance of power. Okay, very, very nice. Now, this constitution, even though it established certain laws, it had, in the future, amendments. You know what amendments are? Changes, additions, all kinds of things that they added. The first 10 are called the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights includes a very important concept the freedom of speech. You heard about that? Yeah. You can get up and say what you want in the street, 
as long as it's not late at night and you're not taking away someone's sleep, right? You can say what you want. You're entitled to your opinion, even about other people, not just about the government. You can say anything you want as long as it's not slander. If it's true, and you can prove it, you can back up what your opinion is about someone, even though it's very negative. It's negative talk. Mutar. The halakha, the rule of this country is, there's nothing called Lashon Hara. You're entitled to say anything you want. And that is why the newspapers, the TV, the internet are full of negative talk, negative speech about just about everyone. If somebody doesn't like you, he'll, he'll say anything he wants. As long as he's, it's, it's not a lie, as long as it's not slanderous. Even though they exaggerate, even though they overdo it, but they can get away with it because of freedom of speech. Isn't that interesting? Everything is possible to say, even though it's negative about another individual. It will hurt him. No, but it's true. You can back it up. You can say it. You see what I mean? The rabbis tell us, Torah bagoim al tamim. Therefore, if somebody tells you they have a good system of laws, don't believe it. Here's an example. They don't understand what this does to society and to the individual himself. What did we just say before? What does speech do? Speech can either connect or disconnect. It can hurt others and it can hurt the individual himself. So why allow all this freedom of speech if it's so negative? Well, obviously this is what they believe in. Everyone is entitled to say what he wants, to worship anything he wants, to do almost anything he wants as long as it's not going to interfere with somebody else's life, of course. There needs to be law and order. So to talk negatively about another individual, yeah, that is what they do in this country. What is their concern? What is a real concern? So I'm going to choose one. There's a lot of concerns in the news. One of the things that bothers them a lot today is global warming. What are we going to do about global warming? The air is being contaminated. The polar bears are going to die. That's what they're talking about. What this is going to do, the effects that this is going to have, the global warming. So they're concerned about the climate, the weather. So here they're concerned about this climate, but the climate of society is not important to them. Don't you see how society is breaking down? Our people, people are not as friendly as they used to be. Our homes are falling apart. Relationships are suffering. What about that climate? Don't you want to improve that climate where people can get along better with others, deal better with others? It's terrible. Anyone who's in business I'm sure has heard about the people who intentionally prepare themselves to claim bankruptcy. They will borrow a lot of money from the yeah. person who they're used to borrowing or buying on credit and then going bankrupt. What about honesty? <laughs> what about loyalty? All these things don't mean, all of a sudden these things don't mean anything and they used to. In the past, if you recall 50 years ago, I'm sure, Things were a little bit different. And it's not because the economy was better. Not only because of that, because people understood, people had certain values. So all these values are going out the window. Why aren't they asking these questions? You don't see in the news people talking about these issues. How come there's these types of problems? Crime occasionally they talk about. There's a lot of crime. And they try to do something about it. That they better do because that interferes directly with their life. They, can't, they, they don't want to live in fear, so they, you know, try to tackle the problem of crime. Drugs is also a big issue because they realize the effects the drugs have on people. So certain things they talk about because they see the consequences, and there's debates about this. Should we legalize it or not legalize it, and so forth. But no mention whatsoever Correct me if I'm wrong. Look everywhere about what to do to improve society, how to make people better people. Yeah, but 
we know about classes and books that are written about character refinement, but they're in the library or in the bookstore. It's not being taught in school. What you will see in school perhaps is a little bit of business ethics, no conflict of interest. These are the kinds of things that they are familiar with because they realize that this could be a source of trouble if there's a conflict of interest. They understand that people are biased and may do something that is wrong. So ethically, morally, they understand certain things. But what about negative speech? Hurting another individual, talking about him, bad-mouthing him. Don't you realize what this is doing to yourself? They're totally unfamiliar with this. Do you know that in many homes today, if you measure the volume of the speech in the house and the content, a lot of it is curse, curses and foul language, something that was not known in the past. If you were to go into the average home in this country and other countries, you will hear a lot of foul language, curses, whether it's cursing each other or cursing other people. This did not exist in the past. Today you hear more and more. If you study the parasha well, you will realize that there are several groups in the parasha. We don't have the time to go through all the groups, but I'm going to just choose two. There is a very special group called the group that asked Moshe for a second chance to bring the Korban Pesach. They were unclean, and they could not, as a result of their Tum'ah, bring the Korban Pesach. You recall that? So they asked Moshe, can't we have a second chance to observe this beautiful mitzvah of bringing the Pesach sacrifice? And Moshe says, I never heard of such a thing as a second chance. If you missed it on Pesach, then that's it. No, Hashem says no. They asked something very, very good. They asked for a second chance. I'm going to give it to them. And that is where the mitzvah of Pesach Sheni came about. A second chance to observe a very interesting mitzvah. This, of course, in itself has many, many valuable lessons. How Hashem allows us to, to sometimes redo something that was done wrong a second time around. We missed out on a mitzvah, we're given a second chance. There's a lot of important lessons from this alone. But I just, what I want to do is just focus on how these people were motivated to do something so special. They didn't have to. They were exempt, by the way. They, didn't, they were unclean, and therefore they were exempt. They want, they want very, very much to do this mitzvah. Now let's turn to the second group. There was a group that had ta'ava. They had great desire. For what? They want to eat meat, steak. Even though the man was completely sufficient for them, very nourishing food they had. They're in the mood of having steak. They want to eat meat. The end of that episode was not too good. They were punished, even though they got their meat. But wait a minute. What's the difference between these two groups? One group is asking for something spiritual in nature, mitzvah. Nothing to do with food. No craving of something physical. In this other group, all they're thinking about is food. What, what's the difference between these two? Why one wants to do mitzvah, that's what he cares about very much, he wants a second chance. And this one is thinking about food. It's not enough to be a psychologist. You won't be able to figure it out so simple. It has something to do with a, a deeper symptom. We make a very special blessing after eating certain foods. The blessing called bore nefashot. You recall? We say bore nefashot rabot chesronan. We thank Hashem for having created numerous living beings with their needs. He provides for the needs of everything that Hashem created. Chesronan, interesting word. What does chesronan mean? Their needs. Yes, but it means something else other than needs. Chaser, something is missing, something is lacking. And therefore we feel a need for it. Okay, that makes sense then what exactly does a person need? Well, some people are drawn or feel a need for something spiritual, and some people feel a need or are drawn to something physical. 
Because that's what a need is. When someone expresses a need, it's because he's lacking something. They are lacking something physical, they're lacking something spiritual. But that still does not answer the question, why? That takes us back to what we said before. The oil in the menorah, not only is it symbolic of the soul, it is also symbolic of the light of the Torah. The oil represents Torah. If a Jew learns Torah, he will realize that his real need is the needs of the neshama. That is the more important needs, the spiritual needs. The physical needs we need because we have a physical body, but the more important ones will always be the spiritual needs. If one does not have that oil, one does not have that Torah, automatically all he will have will be physical needs. So the reason why some people are drawn to the physical is because they have no spirituality in their life whatsoever. It's empty. Then obviously they don't care about these things. They will even make fun of it. Those therefore that learn Torah, that have that oil in their life, that have that light, all of a sudden they feel, wait a minute, my neshama needs, needs, needs to learn, needs to perform mitzvah. They will feel drawn towards the spiritual. A very important, therefore, difference between people depending on how much they give importance to the study of the Torah or not. The more interest we show in the study of the Torah, the more we will feel drawn towards that which is spiritual. If there is no Torah, then there will only be, by default, the body's physical needs, food and the like. This unfortunately happens many, many times in life when people don't have the time to study Torah. They're very, very busy at work. And as a result of that, all they think about and all they crave are about physical things. People have to realize that they're doing themselves a disfavor by not setting aside some time for learning Torah. And if they do, they will notice the difference right away. That Torah, that light will elevate them, will remind them of their purpose in life. It will give them another completely different perspective of, the, of what life is. You ask me, why is that perspective so important? Well, one of the things they will learn with that new perspective is how to treat people, hopefully. Is the value of another human being, how to look at him, how to talk to him. Without Torah, you can't expect from people to do the right thing. They will just think that they come first. That's the normal human nature, that He's selfish and focuses more on himself than on another individual. If someone talks negatively about another individual, if he speaks the Shonara, it shows that he's very, very weak in that which is spiritual. His spiritual connection is very weak. Otherwise, he wouldn't come to that. Now, don't get me wrong. Miriam was a Neviah. She was on a very high level of prophecy. We can't blame her for not being spiritual. So what does that mean? How could she talk negative? Well, the obvious answer to that is that even the greatest of people can make mistakes. She didn't realize the level of Moshe. Moshe was in constant communication with Hashem at all times, not once in a while like she was or, or her brother. And because of his constant relationship with Hashem that would speak to him almost every day and every moment without telling him when he's speaking to him, he had to be pure, he had to be holy at all times. Therefore, he on his own understood that he needed to stay away from his wife. And Hashem agreed with that. He didn't do anything wrong. So, as much as she was knowledgeable and as much as she was spiritual, she didn't fully comprehend the level of Moshe. And therefore, she engaged in negative talk. But as we said earlier, she could have spared herself all that by just approaching Moshe, my brother, can you explain to me why you're doing this? And that is the normal thing to do. That is the correct thing to do when people have any doubts about why people are doing something. Have a conversation with them. And if you disagree with them, say, okay, I disagree with you. But to speak negatively about someone, what are you accomplishing? People want to belittle others and to put them down and to show that they're worthless, that they are superior to them in some ways. And that is what's wrong. They don't realize that when they do that, they're lowering themselves as well. Therefore, there's a pasuk, Know your God and serve Him. 
It is only when we know our God, when we learn about Hashem in the Torah, that we are able to serve Him properly. Without the knowledge of the Torah, it is impossible to do things in the proper way. So, we just said that the Constitution doesn't teach about Lashon Hara. What does the Torah tell us to do, therefore? How can we be careful with Lashon Hara? So the first thing is what the verse says in Tehillim, Netzor Lashon Hamira, Usfatecha Midaber Mirma. Just watch your tongue. The rabbis tell us it's not only about negative speech that you have to watch your tongue from, it's also about too much talk. When a person talks too much, he automatically falls. He will stumble. He will say things that he will later regret. If you don't talk, you're in control. Once you've said a word, the word will control you. It's very hard to take back those words. So therefore, hashetika, silence, as they say, I think in English, is golden, right? It's, it's something very, very special. Sometimes it's just better not to say anything than to say something and then regret what you said. So netzor leshoncha meraz fatecha midaber mirma means watch your tongue, guard it from saying anything that's bad, negative, and definitely from saying anything that's mirma. Mirma is deceit, obviously. Watch out for those things and watch out from talking too much in general. That's a very, very important, I guess you can call it remedy, an important remedy towards having a better relationship with people. This is the best medication to having a better relationship with people. That's the number one thing. What else should we do? What's the, the end of that pasuk say? That is the exact thing that Aaron did. Pursue peace and want peace. Bakeshalom means that you should want it and you should pursue it. What's the difference between wanting it and pursuing it? You should want it for yourself. How do you want it for yourself? Well, let's say somebody is in a very big fight with you, some disagreement. You're going to go to court because of that. Should you? Perhaps you can settle it. But shalom. It is always best to try to find a settlement. You should want to be in peace with everyone not fighting. Some people are in the mood of, I'll see you in court. What for? Try to settle things. Pursue it. Pursue it means when you see other people, other couples, other individuals who are having a hard time between themselves, pursue peace. That's exactly what Aaron did. He pursued peace amongst people. Whenever he saw there was a situation that was out of control, or people didn't speak to each other anymore, he made it his business to try to bring peace into that home, into that relationship. This is something very special, but why is, why is that important for us to know here? Because we're talking about somebody that may have the weakness of Lashonara. How can we help him? How can we cure him of that uh, habit that he had of speaking negatively about others? If he begins to try to bring peace amongst others, you think he will talk Lashonara about them? It's a contradiction. Here he wants to help people. Here he's seeking peace. He's a peaceful man, not one who wants to fight. Unfortunately, there are places in the world where you will see people pushing each other to get to the bus first. They're in line, push. Why push? If that's where it begins. It begins with small things like that. If you're pushing someone, you try to get in front of him, that means you don't respect him. He was there before you. I'm in a hurry. <laughs> All right, then ask permission. Tell him, I'm in a hurry, can I go ahead of you? So there's a lot of examples of what people do. They don't realize small things, but it shows a disrespect for someone else. But it begins with the speech. Because the, unfortunately, the tongue is very loose, very loose. You're not always standing in line, but the tongue is always busy. It's loose, and that is where people sometimes are careless and say things that they should not say about other people. Who gave you permission to talk about someone else? It's none of your business. Focus on your own life. But people are curious, people want to talk about someone. Oh, do you know she's pregnant? What business is it yours to talk about somebody else that is not your relative that she's pregnant? 
I, I just chose, you know, a random example. That's not proper. It's not, it's not a good thing. Because this conversation would lead to someone else. This conversation would lead to something else that may, may be even less proper. Don't talk about things that you shouldn't have to talk about. Did you hear about this guy? Did this, this, this happened to him. Is it really important to speak about it? Can you help him? <laughs> Why talk about it? Why bring it up? Now, this is not negative, necessarily. It's not negative, but it's not right. It's not proper to talk about other people's business and other people's life, unless there's a great need. In order for us not to make a mistake, it's important to study the halachot of Lashon Hara. What to say, what not to say. People ask you questions about someone. Can you tell me? Can I trust this guy? Well, that's a whole different story. As long as you're going to tell the truth, as long as it's, you're doing him a favor, he wants to go into business with him, you have to help him. If you know something that's not good, this guy doesn't pay on time, this guy uh, doesn't uh, do things completely legal, you have to warn him. There are, of course, halachot. What is permissible to say and what is not permissible to say. So, halachot is always going to be important, but before we get to the halachot, these are the things that we can adopt that will help us not even want to go in that direction. But ke shalom v'ratfil, pursue peace. You want, to, you want to be in good terms with everyone, don't you? Well, then make it your business to pursue it. Not only for yourself to be in peace with others, but if you see other people are having a hard time, try to make peace amongst them. This habit or this type of uh, behavior will definitely help eliminate Lashon Hara. Sometimes people really are not too good. They don't behave right. And you're, you're tempted to say something negative about them. Try to find something good in them. Look at yourself in the mirror and you say to yourself, well, I have my own deficiencies. I have my own faults. Who am I to judge him? Who am I to say something about him? People don't stop to do that. They immediately react when they see or hear something negative. Don't, don't react so quickly. Think for a moment. Perhaps you should give him the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps you should approach him and speak to him. People just rush to, to be negative, and that's where they make this big mistake that not only costs them their relationship with another human being, but they themselves, their spiritual level, suffers as a result. So always try to see the good in people. Even though the person may have certain weaknesses, he may have something good as well. No one has all the weaknesses. Perhaps there's something good in him. And I, I think that's a very, very good practice. I, whenever I see, whenever I overhear people saying something negative, I say, oh, by the way, you know, he is a very patient individual. I just choose whatever I, I recall about that. He's a very patient. So they, tell, they, they turn to me and say, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> well, there's some good qualities in that, in that individual. Why are you pointing only to the negative? Give me a tissue. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of what I'm talking about. I think a tissue is the example that I've used in the past. I take a tissue or a piece of paper that's completely white, clean, and I show it to people and I ask them, tell me what you see. And a lot of people tell me, I see a black dot. I tell them, that's funny, I see a lot of white and clean. Why are you pointing to the black dot? Why don't you tell me how beautiful and clean the whole paper is? Some people choose to talk about the black dot. <laughs> the defects. He's stingy. <laughs> you say, he, maybe he's stingy, but you know he's very kind to his wife, he's a good husband, he's a good father. And instead of being stingy, perhaps, instead of calling somebody stingy, maybe you mean he's economical. It sounds a lot better. Stingy, chasis, yeah. or bachil, you know. This, these are very, very hard words <laughs> to say about someone, you know. So perhaps he's just economical. He's trying to save money. There's always ways to turn the conversation around. It's easy, but you have to get used to it. 
what happens when we learn about our own weaknesses? And that can happen, by the way, when we learn Sifre Musar, books of Musar, we're learning a book on Jewish ethics that will point to certain character flaws. We're going to read it, and we're going to say, wow, I think that's me. Nobody's in the room. We're reading it to ourselves, and it helps. What this is supposed to do eventually is supposed to make an individual humble. Who is humble in this parasha? Moshe Rabbeinu. Vaish Moshe Anav Me'od. The Torah says he's a humble individual. He didn't react. He didn't respond to his brother and sister. He didn't complain to them because he was humble. The humbler a person is, not only does it not bother him as much, but he will never do it to somebody else. So humbleness is obviously something that we need to aspire to become because this will help us in many areas of life. Another idea that can be very helpful for people who have gotten into the habit of speaking a Shonara about others and see only the negative, train yourself to always say thank you. There are some groups in this parasha, there are some individuals in this parasha who complained to Moshe. And you see this throughout the 40 years in the desert that there were certain groups that all they did was complain. They were never happy. Not only that, they were ungrateful. Here they received so much. Hashem took them out of Egypt. He provided for them. So why not say thank you? Only complaints. It's a problem. There are people whose nature is to be ungrateful, to always complain, to never be happy. It's something that we need to get used to. Always say thank you. Your wife does something for you. Your husband does something for you. Say thank you. Even though they need to do it anyway. She needs to cook you dinner. That's right. Okay. She's yours. But you can still say thank you. It's a good habit to appreciate someone, what they did for you. What are we talking about after all? We're talking about building a relationship, connections. What you say will make a difference. Either for the for the better or for the worse, chaz v'shalom, depending on what was said. If you said something negative, I don't like it. Why didn't you make me this? You know what that does? It, it creates tremendous scars on the relationship. And some of these scars never heal because they're continuous. You know, when there's a scar and you let it heal for a week or two, then it heals maybe. But imagine every other day, the man or the woman says something negative. So there's continuous scars, and there's never time for that scar to heal. Saying thank you is very, very powerful, because it connects the two in a very, very powerful way. In the same way that saying thank you connects us with people, with human beings, it also connects us with Hashem. That is why in our prayer, in the tefillah, you will find a lot of times the expressions of thanks to Hashem for everything that He does for us. We praise Him, we thank Him, and we do so several times a day. Have you ever said, have you ever heard someone say, I, I already thanked Hashem last year. <laughs> You're alive today. He gives you life every day. You have to thank Him every day. A lot of people didn't wake up this morning. Some people were fine, and all of a sudden, they had a heart attack. And that's it and they're gone. People take for granted these things. So therefore, the thank you reminds us of our dependence in Hashem and hopefully will strengthen our connection with Him as well because we will realize how much He does for us and how much we should be grateful for. So the same thing is true with human beings. The more we get used to the habit of saying thank you, it will be more difficult for us to complain to that individual or to speak negatively about him. Now I'm going to tell you something that you may never have heard. Some people like to call it others by their last name instead of their first name. Have you noticed that? Have you, has anybody ever called you by your last name instead of your first name? Yes. Yeah. A lot of times. Is that good or, wrong or bad? Huh? What's so good about that? No, but what, what about your first name? Why don't they call you by your first name? They feel distance. Exactly. First name is closeness. If somebody calls you by your last name, he wants distance. 
Somebody told me, but wait a minute. Distance. Somebody told me, wait a minute, in the army, there's a lot of Moshe. <laughs> you can't say Moshe. There's a whole bunch of soldiers with the first name. So say the first and the last name. Anytime somebody chooses, chooses on his own to use the last name, it's because he wants the distance. The first name is re the real name of the person, not his family name. Moshe, Abraham, Sarah, or whatever your name is, that is so much more special. Why call him by his family name, which doesn't really have that much meaning? His first name is his real essence. But people subconsciously don't realize that maybe they want distance exactly like you said. And that's a shame. It's a shame. People sometimes don't want that closeness and they don't know how to say it. And they automatically choose to say the last name because that's what comes to mind to them if they're not interested in you. If somebody's really interested in you, he will call you by your first name. People who complain, the same thing. Someone who's always whining and complaining and never happy, he's definitely not looking for a very strong relationship. As the verse in Mishlei says, Nirgan mafrid aluf. Nirgan mafrid aluf. That's a very, very powerful statement that Shlomo Melech says. A nirgan is a person who's never happy and he's always complaining no matter how good you are to him. He's a very, very unique character. It's very difficult to understand that Shalom Amalek, in, in other words, says you might as well give up on him because he's a lost case. Somebody like that, who no matter what you do for him, will always be unhappy and always complain. A nirgan, which I don't think there's a translation for it in any other language that I know. You will never make him happy. What does he accomplish by his nirganut? Mafrid aluf. He makes even his best friends, who used to be his fr best friends, stay away from him. Nobody wants to be his friend. So complaining, always complaining and always whining about something, is going to take someone in the opposite direction. If you're trying to build a relationship, you won't succeed by being a whiner and complainer. So you see how all of these acts, all of, all of these deeds are very important because they either connect or disconnect people from each other. Important therefore to complain less. How do we do that? <laughs> rabbis tell us, the rabbis remind us many many times, don't forget when people insult you, something happens to you, regardless of whether that person did it intentionally or not, it makes no difference. It's all in the if somebody insulted you, he insulted you. Not only said something that nice, he insulted you. Just accept it. Swallow it. Now, obviously, there are times that we need to defend ourselves because if he's accusing us of something which is totally without any foundation, you have complete right to, to defend yourself and to correct him. But sometimes you, cannot, you can never win with someone. They're so negative and they're always complaining. And that's the way they are. They're not educated they're not mature, that you're not going to win. So therefore, if you're not going to win, then why continue to fight and stoop to his level? He's waiting for that. And then the fight becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and you lose. So if you want to win, keep your, keep your mouth shut and just hear what he has to say. But how should you take it? Say to yourself, it's Omen HaShemayim. Why is that important to say that it's Omen HaShemayim? Because if you only train yourself to keep your mouth shut, then inside you will be eating yourself up. You will be upset. Upset, burning mad, but you're keeping your mouth shut. So keeping your mouth shut by itself is very, very admirable, but it's not enough. You also have to have the right perspective, the outlook. Wait a minute. If my ears had to hear those insults, it means that Hashem wanted me to hear it. He is wrong. But I had to hear it, and I'm accepting it. You see why learning is so important? If we don't learn, we won't know how to deal with people. Now, even if we learn, we make mistakes. We still make mistakes. Miriam made a mistake. Okay, mistakes are possible. We have to shuva. But if without learning, can you imagine the average individual out there, Jew or non-Jew, who does not know anything about this? He's going to be upset. He's going to sue him in court. He's going to fight him. He may even... Phys be physical and hit him if he says something that nice to him. You know how many people 
got killed because of a parking spot. They call this in this country road rage. <laughs> road rage, what for? Uneducated, totally uneducated, perhaps a little bit selfish, perhaps nervous. There are all kinds of reasons why people become so anxious. You know, we're not here to judge anyone. All I'm saying is that the more learned a person is, he will look at things completely differently. And last but not least, let's not forget the biggest favor that we can do for ourselves, not only for people and being nice to them, because we want to connect with them and live in peace with them. The biggest favor we can do for ourselves is always speak about people in a positive way. Why? Because when we speak good about people, they will speak good about us. Don't you want mashamayim that they should say something good about you? As the rabbis tell us, Kol If you have pity on others, they will have pity on you. In the end, it's all measure for measure. So in the end, we are the ones that are going to gain from being nice and kind to others. Of course, people will gain from our favor. People will gain from our being patient with them. Of course, that's always true. But you yourself will become a better person. You'll become a more patient individual, more loving, kind, generous. There's so many good qualities that we can train ourselves, even though we're not born with them, that we can train ourselves to adopt and make it a second nature. Not everybody is born generous, not everybody's born patient, not everybody's born, you know, uh, being kind to others and sensitive. No. People have their, their own nature. But it doesn't mean that that's the way you are and you're stuck that way. We have to refine our character. And that is the, the message that Aaron gave us in the very beginning of the parasha. You want to avoid the conflicts with people. You want to speak good about people. You want to look at the neshama of the individual. That is what the light of the candle is. And you want to kindle it. And when you kindle the light of others, you're kindling your own light. I think that is a very powerful idea because the end of the parasha appears to be something that's not so good, something that's destructive, and something that has led to many, many problems in, in, in life, when people say something negative about another individual. But the question is, yeah, well, how do we avoid all of that? Turn to the beginning of the parasha and see who Aaron was and what he represented. He represented what the rabbis tell us, Ohev Shalom Verodev Shalom. It was his way of dealing with problems, not running away from them, and not saying, oh, I can't, there's nothing for me to do. Maybe I should be just like them. No, chaz v'shalom. On the contrary, if you have the ability and you have the patience and you have the maturity to understand that people are really wrong in the way they behave, then take it into your hands and do something about it. Try. You know, when somebody is very, very nervous and you say a nice word to them, it, it could be that that nervousness will go away all of a sudden. They're going to calm down just because of one word that you said. You know, you gave them the attention, you showed them that you care about them. When people have issues, they need to talk to someone. And if you have the ability to talk and not get nervous yourself or upset, then do so. That is the character of Aaron, and that is what the rabbis stress that every Jew should pursue in life. O have shalom, shalom, that he loves peace and pursues peace in the lives of others as well. Amen.